Greetings, everyone. Uh, we acknowledge that Washington, D.C. sits on the ancestral lands of the Anacostans, also documented as Nacochtank, who are now part of the Piscataway Indian Nation. And we celebrate with gratitude um, the Native American survivals of forced removal, culture erasure, and we honor the ancestors. So it's very, very important for us at the University of District of Columbia to honor uh, Native Americans and to acknowledge uh, the land where UDC sits. So welcome. This is a Sigma Tau Delta event, English club. Um, and I'm going to introduce Dagmara Garces Ruiz, who is the vice president of Sigma Tau Delta. Welcome. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Dagmara. I want to welcome you all to our Black History Month event organized by Sigma Tau Delta. I am the vice president of the organization at the UDC. And this is an English honor society for students at accredited uh, colleges and universities that confer distinction for high achieve achievement in English language, literature, and writing, and is dedicated to fostering literacy and all aspects of the discipline of English. I invite you all English mayors to join us. Um, you can take a look at uh, Sigma Tau Delta website. And if you are interested, please email us and uh, we will uh, take a look at, uh, at this matter. Um, uh, please uh, share your short story or poem with us uh, at the end of the event. Leave your first and last name in the chat to sign in for uh, the open mic. Thank you. And welcome again, so I'm Dr. Ada Villageliu Diaz. I'm an assistant professor of English at UDC. And so here I have my students from American Authors and also uh, Discovery Writing. And we're also joined by the students uh, by Dr. Aparajita Day um, and the class is Literary Criticism too. So I'm gonna let her introduce her students now. Thank you, uh, Dr. Diaz, and welcome to all of us. I'm, I'm so proud to see Aliria Butler, um, Dagmara, um, Leticia Bagwell. They are all in my classes, uh, Literary Criticism. We are expecting more to join. So well, all of you already here, and a big shout out to all of you that are going to come in as well. Thank you. And I also want to introduce Dr. Helene Kropphammer, who's the program director in the English program, who is going to introduce our guest author today. Thank you, Dr. Villagelo Diaz. Uh, yes, I'm Helene Kropphammer, uh, program director and professor of English. And I have the honor of introducing Rian Amilcar Scott. Uh, who is the author of the story collection, The World Doesn't Require You, uh, and was a finalist for the Penn Gene, Gene Stein Book Award and winner of the 2020 Towson Prize for Literature. His debut story collection, Insurrections, was, was awarded the 2017 Penn Bingham Prize for debut fiction and the 2017 Hillsdale Award from the Fellowship of Southern Writers. His work has been published in places such as The New Yorker, The Kenyon Review, uh, Crab Orchard Review, Best Small Fictions 2020, and The Rumpus, among others. His story, Shape Ups at Delilah's, was published in Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy. He was raised in Silver Spring, Maryland, and earned an MFA from George Mason University, where he won the Mary Roberts Reiner Award, a Completion Fellowship, and an Annual Exemplar Award, an Alumni Exemplar Award. He has received fellowships from Breadloaf Writing Conference, Kimbilia, and the Colgate Writing Conference, as well as a 20, 2019 Maryland Individual Artist Award. And presently, he teaches creative writing at the University of Maryland. Um, uh, so again, um, I introduce uh, Rian Amilcar Scott. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Um, it, uh, it, you know, uh, speaking at a speaking at a HBCU during uh, during Black History Month. I'm also a proud HBCU grad, um, Howard. Um, so I'm 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 very 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 happy to uh, 
to uh, to be here. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit um, from my um, from my second collection, uh, "The World Doesn't Require You." Um, and one of the reasons why I love speaking for Black History Month is that um, yeah, um, uh, most of my stories are are are, are rooted in um, in in history in some in some form or fashion. Um, yeah, I my um, I write about this imagined place called Cross River, Maryland, and it has a it has an a, imagined history in that uh, it was founded uh, by the um, by after a slave revolt. Um, but after a successful slave revolt, um, and and that's an imagined history that's something that I made up, but uh, but it's it's also rooted in in the uh, in in the Haitian Revolution. Um, that, that's what really inspired me um, to think about um, this this sort of what if history. What if we had a a, a a a revolt here that was that had that had that level of success that um, the, um, the 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 people who plotted. Um, you know, uh, and revolted, uh, were able to to build this uh th this new future. Um, so I'm going to read from from two stories. Um, one uh, I'm going to read an excerpt of 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 a, of a long story called the, the Temple of Practical Arts. Um, and then I'm going to read a um a, a, a very a shorter story. Um, these stories are are uh, are connected. A lot a lot of stories in the book are are connected. Um, you guys are all right out there. I wish I wish I could be there in person. All right, so uh, this first story I'm I'm, I'm going to read is called the, the the Temple of Practical Arts, and it um um it, it takes place on this uh this this artistic commune um in uh, uh that um the uh the people who live there are are squatters um it uh, it, it 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 had a a history as a as a as a, a plantation. The kid's car pulled up in front of the temple one starless night when the sky appeared vast and dark. I was sitting on the porch when the golden car grumbled in. On security duty, it was my job to eye passing cars as suspiciously as people in Cross Yuga and Port Yuga eyed us. The wrong balance of things of people could topple the serenity of this new history we were building. The deity's wife stood leaning into the doorway, peeling an orange, enjoying fully the early summer warmth. She wore shorts so short, when I stood behind her, I thought I could see the beginning of a curve, but I may have just been imagining that. I could never figure the truth of her flesh from the fantasy of it. I rose and approached the car. The man who stepped out of the Honda wore wrinkled clothes, perhaps freshly fished from the bottom of a dirty laundry pile and had a thick knotty beard and dreadlocks that scraped at his shoulders. His cheeks looked shallow, looked like shallow dry lakes and his skin the pale dust of arid earth. Hello, he said, I've been driving for days. I didn't think my car would make it. I'm exhausted. I've come to, you know, we have, we have a visitor. <laughs> uh, there's not no flop house, I said. There are motels a few miles to the south in Port Yuga or a bit to the west in Cross River. I suggest you go to those places. I've come to learn river beat from the master. He shambled forward a step, two steps. I put my hand in my pocket and thumb the rough edge of the knife I kept in, I kept in there on these nights. I wasn't supposed to have the weapon, but self-defense is a human right. There were women and kids here to protect. After all, if I were master deity, I steady my core, center my breath, and prepare my palm to repel him with a slap boxing attack. I'm not the master though. Don't step any further, I said. My little buddy Osiris is worried too. The man pointed to a plump cat at his heels, black with flecks of brown in his fur, a tuft of white beneath his mouth, a golden left eye and a creamy right one. If you can spare a little kindness, he continued, the only food I have belongs to this little fellow. I'd appreciate if, I, if you could save me from a fancy feast dinner or just provide me with a place to rest my head. Look, my will to learn from Master Deity is strong, but if you all don't see fit to teach me, at least let me rest. Out of the luck, bro. We out of spaces and I felt a shove at my shoulder that nearly knocked me to the earth. Master Didi's wife pushed, pushed by me. 
taught you compassion, Slim. She placed a hand on the man's shoulder. I'm sorry about that. Some people can be overprotective. I'm sure you can understand. Follow me. I think we have a guest room available in the basement. You may have to share it with a few others. Is that okay? The man nodded and, and the two of them stepped up the stairs followed by the cat. Now you get settled, I'm bringing you some rice. Master Didi is not gonna be happy about this, I said. And the nagging whine of my voice disgusted even me. She didn't turn, she called. If Dave has a problem, tell him to come see me. It would be a lie to say I forgot about the kid after a few days passed, but I had trials to prepare for. And he seemed harmless, a bit annoying in the way he did nothing but eat rice, watch us and walk with his hands clutched behind his back as if he were a master. After a month or so, he became like a chicken or a cow, part of the farm fauna that served as the backdrop to my life. I didn't befriend the cows or the chickens. I just passed them on my way from here to there and I could scarcely tell one from the other. Late night, late one night, I got off work and walked with limbs, with tired limbs to meet my band at our practice spot by the pigs. I heard the singing chick's voice from a distance. At first I thought she was shouting, but as I got closer, I realized she was singing a song I had written. Her destruction of it made my already weary joints ache. She could sing when she wanted to, but tonight her voice made even the stars ugly. I said nothing to my bandmates, preferring to let my guitar be my greeting as well as my contribution to any conversation. The drummer played something beautiful and I nestled my sound within his rhythm and the keyboard coon pressed his fingers to his keys. He stunned me. It truly amazed me the way he could turn any melody into a mediocrity. I rested on the slats of a wooden fence, strumming my guitar, lightning fingered, hoping my notes would quiet the grunting of the pigs, the grunting of the singing chick, hoping it could turn the keyboard coon into a virtuoso. And then together with the drummer, strike a hole right through the universe. I felt a tingling, no a burning at the back of my neck. You know that feeling when someone's watching. I twirled as if the force of a bullet had spun my body. I must have looked a sight, standing there a little ways off, blank as ever, the kid spied us. Don't mind me, he said, I'm just checking out the sounds. After he finished, after he finished speaking, he settled into an unbroken gaze. That was his annoying habit and it repelled me. He had, he had a stare that made you feel dead. Hey boy, the singing chick called call to the kid. Hey, what do you do? You play an instrument? This was an odd thing for the singing chick to ask. Everyone knew the kid did nothing except eat our rice. He didn't sing, didn't play guitar, or practice slap boxing, play bass, cook, stand guard, sweep, milk cows, 10 pigs. The guy was fucking useless. Huh? No, I, I am scat. You wanna sit with us, the singing chick asked. I would love to. No, I cut in. You and me on vocals, that's the scheme. We don't need any more vocalists. I can do any scatting we need. We just practice in the keyboard, Coon said. Stop getting so butt tight. Do I need to remind you of the trials, I said. We need to gel here. We don't need, guys, I don't wanna be a bother, the kid said. I'm just trying to find my place. Well, it ain't. Across the way, a, a sudden rubbery scent of gasoline. It shut my mouth and took my words. As I breathed, the grid of black smoke collected in the back of my throat. We could see it rising in the distance nearly as well and nearly as well as we could taste it. Someone over by the cows pointed and shouted, it's the rice people. Me, the band, the kid, we stood solemn. Every time something happened to one of the ruins, it happened to us. A tragedy and a failure in our mission to reclaim the land. The people on the rice farm on the other side of the wildlands traded with us. They had been particularly insular, particularly unfriendly, but I took all squatters among the ruins as a sort of extended family, comrades in this journey. One hadn't burnt in so long. The last fire was before I or any of my bandmates arrived. 
The threat of flames hung over our fire hazard homes at all times, though. A burning now and then was inevitable. Fucking weirdo, someone said. I didn't look up to see which idiot was speaking. Probably the keyboard coon. It didn't matter. This moment stood taller than my band. Taller even than if we stood on each other's shoulders. It seemed like, it seems like, the kid said slowly, it seems like it's the fate of all the ruins to burn. What kind of shit was that to say? Had the smoke intoxicated him? Did he not believe and believe deeply in the meaning of our existence, of our reclamation? If not, then why was he here? To jinx us, to curse our mission? If the temple burned, I'd have nowhere to rest my head. I had no other home. I wasn't unique in this. This was not at all a game to me. The kid's presence now seemed to me like a harbinger of some coming terribleness. I wanted to pelt him with a rock shower. I glared at the rising smoke. I glared at the kid. I glared at the smoke. I couldn't tell you at the moment which I hated more. Okay, that, that is the Temple of Practical Arts. Uh, now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read another story called, uh, on the occasion of the death of Freddie Lee. Um, I'm going to read this one in its entirety. It's, uh, it, it's pretty short. Um, now I wrote it for an art exhibit called, um, I initially wrote it for an art exhibit called, um, uh, call and response in which, um, the artists, um, artists, um, make a, a, make a painting and then the writers respond to it that year. They did something different and they brought in food. Wait, I'm going to turn on a light here because it was annoying me. All right, there we go. All right. Um, the, uh, yeah, they brought in food. Um, and so we, we were to meet and, um, and, and, and taste, have a tasting. And then I was going to write a story and then the artist, um, was going to, uh, to, to make a, to make art piece, um, responding to it. And, um, that, that, um, at that time, um, um, uh, the, the Baltimore, um, it was it was it was at the time of the Baltimore the Baltimore riots. Um, the police had had uh, had murdered a guy named Freddie uh, Freddie Gray, um, and they um, and and uh, and you know, the people of Baltimore responded um, in in in, uh, in ways that are uh, um, sort of uh, common <laughs> common in these uh, in, in these instances. Um, and the and the tasting was in was in Baltimore. It was so close to that, that I thought that we were going to have to have to put it all. Um, and I was I was predictably angry about uh, about what happened. Uh, it was it was a particularly egregious case, and I I had a feeling that that nothing was to, was going to happen uh, to to the killers and the murderers. And uh, and un unfortunately, nothing nothing happened. Um, they, they were they went on trial, um, but they were um, they were acquitted. Um, and so. When I got there, they had the, the rice, um, you know, had the smoky taste and it was it was beef in it. And I, and I had this feeling like, you know, I was I was angry. I said, you know, I'm going to write something that 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 encapsulates my anger. I, I was going to write the literary version of of N.W.A. is fuck the police. Uh, <laughs> so I went home and I and I and I, uh, and I and I tried to write that, but that didn't, that's not what came out, um, you know. Um, and, and so um, I wrote a story called On the Occasion of the Death of Freddie Lee. Um, that um that, that responded to uh, uh that that sort of encapsulated all that that I just told you about the the tasting and the uh and and the uh, the uh, the events. Early one morning in the turgid musty swamp, Freddie Lee collapsed amongst the rice in the brown water, a result of working his body like the machine. Both John Henry, the steel driving man, and the locomotive at the same time. He so loved the work, he battled himself to fill basket after endless basket with rice stalks. And as a reward, he fell face down into the crops before any of us woke. We all labored next to his body as we were told to do, coming to view his dead form with a reverence. Freddie was no longer a man, no longer our friend, but instead an offering to God, made to lie out there until Papa Troy gave word. And each night we burned the stalks we picked from around him. But something kept getting to me out in the sun, something beyond the stench, something that rearranged my mind. Man, every time I drew near to the eternally slumbering Freddie Lee and his decaying face. 
I remember when Mama Yona died and we all gathered solemnly for six hours as they put her into the earth and Papa Troy spoke of their life together, building this new world away from the world, away from cars, away from TVs, away from balloons and DVD, DVDs, away from it all at this rice farm in the ruins of a plantation on a Wadlands Hill. The children planted a tree over her resting place and it felt beautiful and unreal as if we existed on a spinning disc covered by a magical dome. Anything could happen here. Freddie Lee believed in this life with the entirety of his unbeknownst to him dying heart. Working the watery fields after my friend passed, I didn't become deranged but found myself somewhere close to it. Something resembling a dark shadow spreading like an ink blot over my brain. I had obeyed dutifully, following after Freddie Lee. I wondered if I'd share his fate, lying among the rice and the muck with a crumbling forever stare. And I could probably have taken it, inky brain and all, had I not seen that blasted cow, Lanier, tearing at Freddie Lee's face ripping, chewing his, chewing his flesh like fresh grass. I waved my arms and yelled, charged the beast while screaming, but a tail swatted at flies and the rest of the animal paid me no mind. The chewed face of Freddy, Papa Troy told us, is just how it's supposed to be. Me and Luke and little Uni went out that night to move the body from the shallow waters, but Mama's thug riders, that's what they call themselves, rode in silently on their horses. At least I didn't hear them. And they waved their whips at us, opening up raw wounds on our chests and backs. When we, were, when we returned to our cabin, we listened to the breeze whistle through the cracks and we tended to each other's wounds. I watched the great house with its light and its mirth. I was sure the drinks flowed there like the river water where we diverted over the land to feed the rice stalks. Papa was having a party. There was always a party and we were the eternally uninvited unless someone important, important wanted a piece of our souls. Papa says everyone is equal, Luke said. Some people are, shh, little Uni said, kissing his lips. I watched them make love. They soon crumpled to the floor, exhausted and sated as they were taught to be. Did you see Freddie Lee's body? I asked, John Henry, the rice harvesting man. If he died harvesting rice for the love of us all, then why, even before that damn cow got to him, was y'all broken and bruised? Shh, little Uni said, but she had no energy to sate me. And before I could ask about the expelled, whether our friend was close to them, as the whispers implied, we all fell one by one into dazed and dizzying fevered dreams. I wonder who was the first to speak of the flames in our sleep murmurs. Did we all share the same nightmares? Morning came, the sun rose hot over the damp fields, and we were once again the docile supplicants of Mama Yona and Papa Troy's mercy, picking rice around our friend, poor Freddie Lee, his face skeletal, except for those swollen staring eyes. He deserved more than the tepid love of cowards. It might've ended right there had Freddie Lee not risen from the dead to rip that cow into thousands of pieces. That morning, Papa had planned to announce his next queen. Could have been any of us, but we woke to bits of bloody cow meat everywhere, smeared on the windows of the great house, clinging to the rice stalks. Papa postponed his announcement and called for us to give, to give up any information we had on the whereabouts of Freddie Lee's body and the circumstances of the cow's death. Some pointed their fingers at the three of us, but we pointed ours right back. If it were us, I said, wouldn't we be stained, marked like we took a, a bath in cow's blood? My logic silenced our accusers. For three hours, Papa Troy stood on the porch of the great house, discussing betrayal and the life of his beloved Lanier. Tears soaked into his beard, his voice as watery as the rice fields. Our hearts broke, but who are we to ramble madly about what we knew, what we saw? the dead man sauntering smoothly, coolly until he spotted that cow. He stopped and threw his head back, wailing silently. The cow had long ripped his tongue from his mouth. His raw face and his perfect eyes bathed in the light of the moon. 
I called his name, but he watched us as if we were merely curiosities to ponder and then ignore. He stared for several seconds before he did his violence. I stayed up many nights afterward to catch another glimpse of Freddie Lee, but I never saw him again. Every once in a while, I'd ask Luke or little Uni if we saw what we really saw and they'd nod like walking corpses without tongues. One evening when the passing of the months had given us no ease from the thug riders and their whippings, little Uni and I stood near the farthest edge of the farm. Did we really see what we saw? I asked again, you know, with Freddie. Shh, she said, shh. She pointed to Luke walking toward us a bundle of stalks in his arm. Behind him, flames had begun dancing along the rice fields. Fires even tap danced upon the face of the waters below. The only world we knew was now shrouded in clouds of black smoke. I watched Luke's rice and breathed in his fumes. He stank of gasoline. Little Uni sighed. Luke cursed, dumped the day's hall to the wet ground. Little Uni lit a match. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. You know, uh, you left us uh, speechless. That was uh, amazing. So uh, is there anyone who have questions? Does anyone um, have questions? I have a question. Okay. So the story you wrote, was there any part of the text that you're most proud of writing? Which which one? Either the whole book or? The whole book, I, I guess. Like, was there a specific part that you're most proud of that you wrote? Um, I think uh, there's a story in there called uh, um, Roll Into My Sixth Foe. Um, uh, that's that's a shortened version of the title. <laughs> the whole version of the title is uh, let me find the whole version of the title. It's a very long title. Um, I'm proud of that in itself. Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, the whole part of the title, the whole title is rolling in my six fold da 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 with all my niggas saying swing down sweet chariot stop and let me ride hell yeah, which is um from a Dr. Dre song, um which is the chorus of a Dr. Dre song and uh, it, it signals that the story is gonna be um gonna be out there and I'm proud of the story because because it's because it's out there <laughs> and um there's, there's a lot going on in it and it was uh, hard for me to uh, um you know it deals with some pretty a pretty heavy history um and it deals in a satirical way uh and I, I didn't want to um I didn't want to deal with all that that heavy stuff because you know pe people have people died over um over these over these stereotypes you know that, that's that's the function of, of, of stereotypes to dehumanize um and you know the 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 uh the creation of our popular culture in this in, in this country is, is sort of the creation of you know the mockery of of of, of black culture black lies black you know black looks you know everything um and i was uh and i wanted to to to, to take that and and mock it right back um but when you're dealing with those heavy themes um it's very easy to to slip into um you know to to, to fall into the trap of actually you know using those using those uh stereotypes in the way that they they've been used before so i was very you know it took me about 10 years to to, to to get this story right i was very very concerned that that someone could read it um well and i was very concerned that the black people would read it and be offended um and 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 um not necessarily offended not necessarily worry about offended but um but um but be um um I, I never want I never want uh, my people to be ashamed of, of me, you know. Um, so you know I was concerned about that, um, but I think I, I think I, I I got it. I hadn't you know people uh, a lot of people you know who who have read it, um, you know have have given me um, given me pass on the back. So you know it makes me feel like I, I I nailed it. I have a question. Um, I'm far. I'm again far from ashamed of your writing, and far from ashamed of African-American history as a whole. I love African-American history. I'm an African-American woman. So, you know, I take it in. I take it all in every day. But um, to be uh, to be a listening ear, your first the first writing that you um, created when you had when you were mentioning 
uh, imagery and symbolism of slave terms and slave terminology. As a new writer who has not yet experienced that form or fashion of levels of um, uh, racial injustice, how did how did it manifest that you could articulate your own creative story? How did that come about where you say, I have an idea, this is going to be from all that I've learned growing up in college or high school, and I'm going to create this story knowing that people my age or people that I know can also relate to it. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's just like, it's, it's just like anything else, you know, it's, it's it, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of practice, um, to really feel like that you, they really feel like you can, uh, you know, you, you can get out on the, on the, on the court, you know, as, as it were, um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a high level and bring, bring everything, bring everything together. You know, I, I really do try to bring, bring in every, every part of my, my understanding of, uh, of life from the, the trivial to the low to the high. Um, but it, it, you know, it, it takes a lot of reading, you know, um, you know, it takes a lot of reading, reading other people's work, emulating, emulating their styles, you know, paying, paying, paying close attention to what's going on in the world, listening to a lot of music, um, you know, and, and just writing, 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 you know, I, I couldn't, you know, I don't think there's nothing in this book that I could have, um, you know, this book was, this book was like a learning process because many of the, many of the stories in this book, um, I started, you know, this book was published in 2019, but a lot of those stories were started back in 05 um, and uh, 06. I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> you know, um, you know, and, and so I had to really write the stories over and over and over again and read a lot, you know, you know, I, countless, countless books, you know, went into the creation of this, um, you know, um, you know, picking up rhythms, you know, um, I, you know, I, it's a constant process of learning about myself um, and, and learning about what, what's, what works for me individually and what has worked for other writers. Um, so yeah, listening to reading interviews with other writers, seeing you know how they develop, um, trying things. Some things won't work. Um, so it's a it's a it's a long, it, it can be a long process, but it's, it can be it'll be rewarding if you if you uh, if you commit to it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or reactions? <laughs> to the reading. I know that one of my questions was gonna be about the Cross River because I noticed it appears in your story. So is Cross River that imaginary space that you have created in all your work? Is that something that you incorporate in all your stories? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where did it start? Yeah, yeah, Cross River is, uh, is something that I, I feel like I'm always gonna be writing about. Um, and and I, um, and yeah, it, um, it started uh, when I was, I guess my, my second semester in grad school, I, I was thinking about I wanted an, an, an approach, you know, I wanted, I wanted something that, that, that unified and connected my stories. Um, and I thought I would write about uh, the DC area, you know, being that I'm from the DC area, you know, I thought my stories would be in um, Silver Spring, Bethesda, and DC. Um, but then I read Edward P. Jones, um, who wrote um, Lost in the City and All on Hagar's Children. Um, it was all on Hagar's Children is probably the, the book that I, I read at the time. And uh, all his stories were set in DC. And uh, I read it and I was just like, okay, you can have DC. <laughs> you got that on lock. <laughs> you, I, I, you know, I, I didn't really feel like I could write DC on, on the, the, the level of detail um, that, that he did. Uh, so I, um, so I, I figured, you know, if I make up a place, no one can write, you know, one can write the place that, that is, uh, that I make up better than me. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, I started thinking about, you know, what, what, you know, what was interesting to me and, and I, and I, you know, I came up with this history, um, of, a, of, a, of a slave revolt, of a successful slave revolt. Um, and, um, you know, it was, a. I set the slave revolt in 1807 because my grandmother was born in 1907, uh, and this was a uh, like I said, this was about 05, 06. She was still living, um, so but I, I wanted to honor her, and uh, and and I, I took off from there. That's awesome. Anyone else has a question? Oh, some of the students read uh, "Shape Ups" by uh, Delilah's. Uh -huh. uh, so there were some reactions about that story earlier. Uh, Dagmara was talking about the story. So Dagmara, do you want to ask him any questions or make any comments about that story? 
Uh, well, I I was saying before that uh, it was amazing that a man was uh, writing about you know something you know it's like I felt when I I was reading until the end that you were somehow uh, coming up with the rights of women now to to be uh, to to make or, or to to do a, a work that some somehow people think that is only men uh, only men are allowed to do it and mm -hmm. uh, i i felt that uh you know i had that feeling that you were somehow uh giving a woman this right <laughs> and that was amazing uh, how, how that story came about was uh when i was a you know uh you know the barbershop is you know is, you know when your men go to the barbershop you know black you know it's it's it's, it's kind of like it's a little it's kind of like you know it's, it's this world where you know the black men hang out in the barbershop and they, and they talk trash and you know and and that that's you know that, that i that that's a very very real thing um and uh you know it was such when i was growing up you know it was you know it was kind of like taboo for a woman to even be in the barbershop that I, that that I, that i went to um and you know and and the idea of a woman cutting hair you know we always thought oh you know it's kind of you know you can't let a woman cut your hair and someone would always you know cite samson and Delilah. and you know it was there, there was this idea that women somehow couldn't couldn't barber well um and um and you know you, you tell a child this you know I, I was you know very young you know a lot of times you tell a child something they they don't you know if they have no reason to question it they'll they'll continue to believe it and, you know I'm, you know I'm going through my whole teen years believing this um without questioning it and uh so i thought back to that you know i, I was a recent you know not recently but um years ago uh you know uh, it was a, there was a, a female barber in in uh in the in the barber shop that that i took my took my child to and uh, and she was the best one in there <laughs> and i started thinking about you know that idea was like you know it, you know, years ago, I wouldn't even have uh, sat in this chair. I wouldn't have considered it. Um, and and I thought about how silly, how how silly uh, and and retrograde um, that that idea was, and 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 how um, a, a lot of times we don't question, you know, as humans, we don't question ideas that are that are just put in our put in our head, um, you know. Um, with so um, so I, so, I, so I, I wanted to, to to dramatize that that a little bit. Yeah, I love the ending of that story. <laughs> and I, I just a fantastic story. So I highly recommend that everyone reads the, the story. I can put it in the chat. Are Thank there you. any other questions? Are there any other questions? And uh, I just wanted to say that you can also listen to his latest book on Audible. Uh, which I'm actually doing, <laughs> and I was listening. I'm still listening to the story about the knockers, <laughs> <laughs> and I was laughing because I remember when I was in graduate school, we did have a conversation about, you know, we're writing about this stuff, but we're not we're out we're not experiencing things, you know. And to me, as a professor, as a scholar, I was looking at the story. I said, I can see myself doing something like this, not the knocking part, but just, you know, going out and thinking, you know, I'm not a real scholar. I need to practice what I'm writing about. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the story is about uh, and what draw you to write it? Okay, uh, the, the story is called The Nigger Knockers and, um, and it's, uh, it's about a, uh, um, a graduate student who, um, who starts, um, uh, who's writing about this uh, this practice um of of doorbell ditching um and uh and 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 that's the term that, that he that he knows it as um and he starts writing a, a history of it uh and where that story came from is that you know as as kids you know we used to do this we used to you know run and knock on doors but we, we used to call it nigga knocking and again it was something that you know when i look back on it is kind of I I asked why didn't we ever question we just, you know the name well we just we just we just took it as a as as a thing you know like hey you want to go nigga knocking yeah let's go nigga knock right and no one ever said why why <laughs> why are we calling it that where does that come from um and uh, so I couldn't find a history of it so I decided to make up make up my own my own history. Uh, 
Um, and yeah, you know, so, you know, I've, I've come to find that it wasn't just in my neighborhood, you know, um, that, that this is a that this is a name that 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 is uh, that is well known um, that people use. I actually didn't know that, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it was very interesting because um, I I know for example because you know what I liked about the story is one of the characters he wants to to practice that whole mythical. It looks like the way you write it, it looks very mythical. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the same way the she pops at Delilah's it's almost like a mythical story uh so how are you using myth in your stories because I see that there's a tendency uh to use that type of, or create your own myth or revise a myth uh reimagine it yeah I'm glad you picked up on that because yeah that is something that 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 I that I that I want to do um in my work you know uh you know across the river being a fictional place I you know I figured it has its own has its own folklore has its own um it, it, you know uh and I think you know history you know I, I want to use you know use history um as 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 uh as myth because um you know I'll, Anytime you experience some, anytime you experience something that's in the past, um, it, it, it's always subject to imagination. Um, even even this morning, you know, um, it's already whatever happened this morning is already fading in, in my memory, and I have to. And every time we remember it, we we embellish it. So um, we never we can never really fully understand um, uh, the past, but it but it really um, but our understanding of it says everything about our present um so um so 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 yeah so you know i i i try to use uh you know history as myth make up my own myth uh even use science as myth um uh re you know um reimagine established myths shapeless of delilah is, is is partly you know reimagining uh samson and delilah um uh, from from the bible Thank you. So we have some faculty here. Um, so is, if there are any other questions, then some students may have read other stuff from your website. So I just want to see if anyone wants to ask uh, anything else. Dr. Day, Dr. Turpin, Dr. Krobhammer, students, any questions? I'm just um, I'm I'm just li I'm, I'm listening and I'm learning. That's what I'm doing, and I am really, really, really astounded, pleasantly astounded at uh, what I've heard today. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful. Absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And I'm looking at your at your pile of books, and it looks like my my living room. Right on. <laughs> It's weird. Yeah, it, it gets it gets worse if you look or if I were to show you the rest of the basement. <laughs> but I'll keep that to myself. <laughs> right on, right on, right on, right on. But you know, keep your books, keep your books. Um, those are essentials. Um, as well as you know, we need to know our history. We need to know who we are, and sometimes we learn that through poetry and fiction. And so, thank you very much. Um, you know, for bringing bringing that and it's a wonderful way of closing out black history month and knowing that we are in the process of making history thank you thank you and i think dr Krothammer wanted to say something as well thank you so much it was wonderful um i know we have a lot of writers in the room and i wonder if you have any advice for them like you know, your writing process, how you've managed to publish and win competitions and all that. So if you have any tips for the writers in the room, I, I think they, they would appreciate that. But thank yeah, you again, uh, that was wonderful. My, my professor, the um, the late Alan Chus used to say, read as much as you can, write as much as you can, live as much as you can in that order. Um, and I, I, would, I, 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 take, I think that's a, a you know, amazing uh, advice. Um, you know, you, you, you have to, you, you have to, you know, be reading constantly, um, and, and then practicing, um, even if you feel like you have nothing to say, because at some point you will have something to say. So make sure that the, 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 uh, the techniques are there when you, when you do, uh, when you, when you're ready. Um, 
and uh, you know, part part of the process is when you, when you're ready, you know, so, uh, research literary journals and and send out to literary journals. We've never been in a time we, they, they have there's a there never been more literary journals. Um, it's never been more accessible. Um, you know, don't 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 just shoot for the top. You know, I was uh, I, I was uh, you know, it was many years before I got into the New Yorker and um. And um, I only got in, you know, they only take really, you know, a lot of the big journals like the New Yorker only take works with agents, you know, I, I you know, I, I submitted many, 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 many times um, before I got in, but, um, you know, it was kind of like just sending, you know, sending out, I might as well have just been, you know, making a paper airplane and, and, and throwing it in the, in, in the river. Um, but, um, you know, I really did cut my teeth to a lot of smaller literary journals like Barrel House. Um, um uh smoke long um so um uh so you know research literary journals um submit work to to to, to places that, that that fit it's a uh it is a it's a good process that that'll 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 help you help you grow um and and the last thing i'd say is is just get comfortable with um with, with rejection um it, it's it, it's 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 a long process um and uh, a lot of times uh when you're sending out work to to literary journals or or to public or to, to, to agents or or to anybody you're going to get a lot of rejections you know uh, you know subject to hundreds of rejections and it never stops you know william faulkner after he won the, the nobel prize we <laughs> got got rejected um so it's not like you know you're ever going to reach a level where it's like where where, where you're 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 going to be the uh, you're going to be the you know is automatic acceptance automatic winning um it's it, it's just a process but you you only need like one one yes you know everyone doesn't have to say yes That's great. I actually have a question about publishing. Um, do you find sometimes that when you try to publish and you're engaging subjects, you know, from the African American community, do you find a little bit more resistance from certain editors and publishers? Um, you know, that's hard to tell because a lot of times you don't know why you're why you're rejected. You know, um, I you know I haven't. I've been lucky, you know. My, my work is, you know, very, very uh, culturally specific, um, but I haven't had any 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 pushback um, on on anything that, that that I've that I've been trying that I'm trying to say or trying trying to publish. Um, and you know, the, you know, this is publishing with largely, um, mostly, you know, white owned white owned publishers and and uh, and presses. And I haven't had any any type of uh, you know, any type of uh, you know, so any any type of halting halting what I'm doing. So um, until yeah, that's uh, excellent. That's great. <laughs> but, but you know what? You know, and uh, you know, I'm, I, I've, I've. It's not like I've, I've heard a lot of you people with, with, with the opposite experience. So it's not like, uh, like that's why I say I'm lucky. You know, um, so, um, you know, that's why I like to, to, hear, to listen to other people's uh, experiences. One thing that I know, um, you know, I, I got a, a, a MFA, um, uh. Uh, in in creative writing, um, and uh, again, I was lucky. I had a really great experience. But a lot of a lot of writers that I know, a lot of black writers, um, a lot of writers of color, um, face a lot of uh, a lot of um, racism in their programs, um, and um, uh, and and that's something that they you know that they they had to find a way to uh, to navigate. So that stuff is out there, you know. Thank you. Um, Dr. Day, did you want uh, to ask any questions? I specifically don't have a question because I think that the story with the Samson and Delilah myth, that sort of, you know, it has percolated somewhere deep. And I'm thinking about myth making, really what, what you were suggesting at a, at a comment earlier and Dr. Diaz too, you know, mentioned myth making. And I'm thinking about the afterlife of myths, you know, uh, cultural myths, historical facts, historical myths, magic realism, and the violence of erasure. So that's, that's where I'm, I'm, you know, trying to connect it someplace. And there's been so much literature around myth making and um, so much literature, literature around uh, uh, mythical references, religious references, you know, fusing the sacred and the secular and the cultural. Uh, and I'm trying to think about partition literature from South Asia. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking about the dangers 
of erasing, uh, 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 you know, in, in the myths that give us refuge, that give us some of us intellectual uh, asylum because of the transmittal of trauma that we are trying to reconcile with um, through the myth making. And I'm thinking about all those narratives of war, violence, di displacement, dislocation. And I'm thinking about the empowering, uh, you know, um, empowerment that is there embedded in myth making. So I'm just, you know, just pondering and in great wonderment. So that's just a comment. It's not a question yet. It's amorphous right now, but this was great. This was great. There's a, um, a I haven't read this book yet. Um, I, I'm, I'm waiting for it to come in the mail. Um, it just, just came out um, uh, by, by uh, an author, um, uh, 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 name uh, Tanai, I mispronounced it. Uh, Tanias, um, it's called Insensorium. Um, they are a um, uh, a uh, a writer and um, and uh, and uh, and a perfumer, um, and and they've written um, about um, about their life. Um, it's, a, it's an essay collection, and uh, I'm not doing this justice. Um, but uh, but uh, it's it's about. Um, you know, uh, since you know, uh, they're Muslim, um, a, a Muslim, um, I believe Bangladeshi author, um, and it's, uh, it's about um, you know this uh, perfuming and 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 their life and 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 uh, and all the all those topics that you're talking about war and and, and violence and yeah, I'm I'm really uh, excited, but I'm looking forward to uh, to getting my hands on it. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put the link in the in, in the oh, chat because I'm yeah, not I'm not. Great. I'm, I'm not doing justice uh, explaining it, but I'm really excited about um, about getting my hands on it. Thank you for sharing that resource. I'm gonna look look them up for sure. Great. So we have reached the uh, point of the event where we wanted to um, to do an open mic to hear where what our students are writing or reading because they can also share something that they have read and they like to share. But we also have free t-shirts. So we're gonna do like a little competition. Uh, but before we move on to the next phase, uh, we wanted to see, uh, you know, invite Rion if he has any final words, <laughs> final advice for writers, uh, anything that you wanna share Rion with us. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Um, uh, I thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, just, uh, just keep writing. Thank you so much. We're going to invite you back when we're in person and we are, <laughs> when everything goes back to normal, if that it will be possible, but yeah, definitely we have to bring you back. Okay. Uh, and your short stories, they need to be, they have to stay on my syllabus because they're, they're awesome. <laughs> I really love it. Yeah. So, um, Maria, do you want to do the um, wheel of names to get to see who gets a T-shirt? Yes. Is it okay? Um, I double check the names. Yes. Two, three times, but this is the list of everyone I have. If you can share your somebody screen. don't see their names on the Instagram chat. If the name missing, please let me know. Okay, so is there anyone who does not see the name? I, did, I didn't add the name of the speaker, not the transcriber, not the members of faculty, but... Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so that's okay. You can share your screen and run the wheel. All right. So here we go. Okay, congratulations. I will make sure that you get your t-shirt. I think you have to pick it up. So we'll let you know where you pick it up, okay? Yay, thank you, Maria. So now let's do the open mic. So I believe there's only three who have signed yeah. up. Could anyone else who wants to sign up? Like Spencer, do you have anything to share? Who else writes over here? Who would like to share? 
Yeah, I have uh, in the queue, Deontay, Latisha, and then I will share a poem, not, not mine, but a poem that I want to share with you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Ria. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. I know that you have to go, so it's okay. <laughs> thank you so much, bye. Okay, Deontay, you can uh, go ahead and share your poem. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today and happy Black History Month. Um, the title of my poem that I wrote is called We the Colored. Whites used to rule the world. They stood supreme while we just failed. Then we stood up and said, we'll have no more of this. Whites aren't best. We followed nonviolence but they countered without sense. As we fail, paralyzed, they spread rumors, they spread lies. We deserve to be equal. We deserve to be free. We deserve to have certain rights, but we are trapped, can't you see? Then one day, Martin Luther King called for justice, called for peace and equality. We the colored were set free. Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat and lose. She started a bus boycott. Oh, a good that boycott brought. Other blacks like Crumb changed the world from what it once become. Just like Douglas and Tubman, but we can live without them. We deserve to be equal. We deserve to be free. We deserve to have certain rights, but we are trapped, can't you see? Then one day, Martin Luther King called for justice, called for peace and equality. We the colored were set free. Now the dark days are over and we stand shoulder by shoulder. We the colored now are free. We the color now have equality. Thank you. Well, amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Deontay. Uh, that was great. Um, well, Leticia, I know that you have a poem that you want to share with us that is not your, but it's something that you want to share because it's your favorite poem. Yes, uh, a poem, a poem of encouragement, a poem of enlightenment, uh, a, a good poem, learning more about poetry in my Principles of Literary Criticism to class. So let's go for it. Do I share my screen or um, to read the poem or can I just, hold on, let me see if I can share it. Oh, okay. I, let me go to this. Let me see if you can still hear me. Dogmar, just, just respond if you can still hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Mother to Son by Langston Hughes. Well, son, I'll tell you. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up in places with no carpet on the floor bare. But all the time I's been a climbing on and reaching lands in and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you set, don't you sit down, don't you set down on the steps cause you finds it kinda hard. Don't you fall now, for I still going, honey. I'll, I is still climbing, and life for me ain't gonna be no crystal stair. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Leticia. Okay, um, I will share a poem, uh, it's a poem by Nicolas Guillen, a Cuban, an Afro-Cuban poet from uh, the 20th century. I came across this poem recently and I, it caught my attention and I want to share it with, it with you because I think that is just 
the day that need to be read. The pawns call what color? His skin was black, but with the purest soul, white as the snow. If Tushenko in a cable on the assassination of Martin Luther King. Such a white soul, they say, that noble pastor had his skin so black, they say, his skin so black in color was on the inside snow, a white lily, fresh milk, cotton. Such innocence, there wasn't one stain on his impeccable interior. In short, a handsome find, the black man whose soul was white, that curiosity. Still, it may be said another way, what a powerful black soul that gentlest of pastors had, what proud black passion, patient, patient, born in his open heart, what pure black thoughts were nourished in his fertile brain, what black love was so colorlessly given, and why not? Why couldn't that heroic pastor have a soul that's black, a soul as black as coal? Nicolas Guillen, and this was translated by Robert Marcos. Okay. Uh, and here we have a poll. You can submit who is your preferred. Okay. So hopefully yeah. everyone participates in the poll and, and there's also a survey in the chat area. So please, if you, if everyone can particip participate in both, that would be great. Okay, do you have the results? So yes, so let me end the poll. So the mm -hmm. person who um, gets the most votes for the open mic gets a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Do you see it? Yeah, Deontay is the winner. He gets it, <laughs> yay. Yay. Oh, I just want to say I did not vote for myself. So usually when we have these polls like this, I never vote for myself. So yeah, I, but I enjoyed um everyone's poem and this event. Thank you very much. And I hope everyone- Thank you. Yeah.